We are diving right back into Romans. Today we'll be focusing on Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 11. And uh, as always, I'm just going to give you a bit of a brief recap for, uh, uh, for those of you that forget where we are at in Romans. So over the past few weeks, as we've been waking our way through Romans 4 and Romans 5, uh, we have seen that the Jewish people primarily that Paul was speaking to, they were dead set on using physical identifiers um, in regards to their salvation. So for many of them, it was heritage. They were Jewish. It was circumcision, and it was good works. And based on those three things, that was what made you saved. And so Paul comes along, and he's like, guys, you've got it all wrong. He said, uh, f- salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And then this element of faith he began teaching on. And he even went as far as to say, your forefathers, Abraham and David, uh, men of great wisdom who you follow and adhere to, uh, well, even they uh, believed in this element of faith over works as you are teaching incorrectly. And so they didn't like this. They got their backs up on this, but it was absolutely true. And Paul, the rest of chapter four, he begins to explain a little bit more about Abraham and how in depth his you know, uh, level of faith was. And they still weren't grasping it at this point. Uh, chapter five, after establishing this element of faith as a key ingredient to salvation, Paul goes on and introduces us, the reader, to hope and how difficult seasons like tribulations in all of our lives are actually beneficial to the life of a Christian. He goes on to say that tribulations, what do they do in a believer's life? Well, they produce perseverance. And that perseverance is somewhat like a tenacity. You keep on going. You don't give up. And then that tenacity, that perseverance grows and matures into character. And it gives us godly character. And at the end of that, all of this comes to a head by producing hope in the believer's life. So this is why Paul later on in in the New Testament says, rejoice in your trials because ultimately those trials, those tribulations, those difficult seasons that we walk through are important to developing elements of perseverance, important to strengthening our godly character, and they're vital to establishing hope because God always comes through, and because he always comes through in our lives, that gives us this permanent etching in our hearts of there's hope for tomorrow. And so today, the question for the Jewish people still remains. And the question that was being asked, we're going to ask it again today, and it's simply this. If we are to remove heritage, circumcision, and good works from the equation, how then can we be assured of our salvation? How do you know that you know that you know that you are saved? See, the Jewish people back then, they taught that if you were Jewish, if you were circumcised, and if you did good works and did follow all these laws, well, then you get salvation. But if once we take those physical identifiers out of the equation, this whole element of faith comes in to replace that, well, where's our assurance? How do we really, really, really know that you're saved. So today, in our reading, Paul continues to paint for us a beautiful picture of faith and hope, and how these two ingredients work together to produce this assurance in the believer's life that we can be saved and know it. So, you have your Bibles, turn to Romans 5, and we're going to be reading Romans 5, uh, 6 to 11. Romans 5, 6 to 11, for when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, 
much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Father in heaven, God, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for the truth that lies within these pages. And God, I simply pray that this morning you will reveal to us in a way that we are able to understand and grasp the truth of salvation. The assurance that we can have that our uh, future and our today is secure in you. God, I pray that you use me in this capacity, even as you had already in first service. But I don't want first service. I want second service. This is, this is a brand new you know, uh, group of people. And God, I pray that there's fresh uh, words for us here this morning. Take control of my mind, my thoughts. I submit them to you. Even the words coming out of my mouth, God, I pray that they will be not mine, but yours. Take control, Lord Jesus, and let us hear from you this morning. And uh, we'll be careful to give you and you alone all of the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In the name that is above any other name, the sweet name of Jesus Christ, all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. So, Romans 5, 6 to 11. This is an interesting, interesting passage, and it's a, uh, it's a bit of a, a, a critical passage as we're walking through Romans. It's, Romans is really, for those of you that are new, uh, is, uh, is basically, as Christians, our theology. What is theology? Theology is theo. The study of God. So basically, it is the study of God. And Romans 5, this section here, talks about this idea of salvation and when God saved us, how he saved us, and at what point in time in history he saved us. And, and all these things kind of work together and come to a culmination here in Romans 5. Now, the first thing um, I want you to see, there's a couple things going on here. The first thing I want you to see here is that our assurance of salvation is not based on anything that we have done, but on everything that Christ has done. And that salvation, our salvation, humanity's salvation, it came at the most specific time in human history. So it was at that point in time when humanity was at its worst that Christ died for us, not when we were at our best. This is important. It was when we were at our worst that Christ died for us, provided a way out, provided salvation, not when we were at our best. If it was when we were good, better, or best, if, if there was any part of that for us, if we were you know, um, good, better, or best, then we would have opportunity for pride to kind of creep in and say, we had a bit of a role in this. Yes, I'm saved. I did this and this and this to earn my salvation. But we know that no man, no woman, no child, no per anybody can earn their salvation. It's a free gift from God. And so the simple fact that he came and provided salvation when humanity was at its worst shows us that there's nothing we could have ever done, nothing we can do, nothing we could ever do to provide for our own salvation. Now, we know this. I know you all know this. You're smart people. We get it. We've been kind of talking about this for the past little while. But, but what I want to draw your attention to today is verse 10, because verse 10 is kind of mind-blowing for me. I understand the concept that while we were sinners, God came and through his son Jesus Christ rescued us. I get that. It makes sense. I read that all the time. But what I don't understand is this word that comes in verse 10 that says, while we were enemies of God. That hit me. I was like, well, I understand that we were sinners, but is he calling us enemies of God? Like, I didn't think we were that bad. I thought, you know, we were just like sinners. We needed, you know, we were like just like bad boys and girls. We had done a few things wrong, and at the end of the day, he kind of just needed to help us along here and, you know, break us out of that. But it doesn't say that we were just sinners. It moves on to bring it to the nth degree when humanity was truly at its worst. And it says that when we were enemies of God, that he brought salvation. Now, I look at, took a look at that word enemies because I thought to myself, it's, it's got to be softer than that. When I break down into the Greek and I look at that word enemies here, the Greek word here is ekthros. Ekthros is usually a word that is reserved for Satan and his hosts. If there was ever a word that was the strongest form of enemies, 
this would be it. It's just not saying that, oh, they're kind of like not, you know, really, you know, in stride with God. It doesn't say that they weren't really tracking with God. It says that they were as far as one could get from God. They were complete enemies. This is how serious uh, you and I, so you and I, before we were saved, were enemies of God. This is how serious sin is. It's because of that sin within our lives. Um, it, can one of the ushers go tell them to turn that down? That would really help me. That would be fantastic. Uh, because of that sin in your life, they're just having a blast in there. I know it. I'm going to be the buzzkill. I understand that. But uh, I, I got to, oh, they're, I, I know, but they can, I, I, <laughs> come on. Someone build me a new building. Okay, so, um, so because of that sin element in our lives, we have to understand that sin stands in direct opposition to God. Everything that is God, sin stands in direct opposition, direct contrast to God. We are enemies. So amazingly, it was at this moment that God sent his son and showed us the incredible love that he has for creation, that he would love his enemies, you and me, so much that he would send his son to stand in their place so that they could have salvation. Like, what kind of a love is that? Like, I, I, you give me a thousand lifetimes to live a thousand lives, and I will never fully, truly comprehend that kind of love. It is a kind of love that is incomprehensible for us as human beings, yet this is the same kind of love that God poured out on his creation when his creation was as far away from him as possible. His creation had turned on him. He viewed his creation as enemies. What's also interesting about this kind of extravagant love is that this action sets a precedent for how he wants us, in turn, to show love. So when Jesus asks us to love our enemies in Matthew 5, it's not just an action. It's not just an instruction. It's not just his ideology good thing for him to place on us and say, hey, love your enemies it's actually um, not just action or instruction. He's asking us to give of what we've already been given. He's asking us to display what's already been displayed to us in our lives. The kind of love that he has shown us when we were enemies is the kind of love that he is now asking us to show our enemies as well, Matthew 5, 43 to 48 says this, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends his rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now what I want you to notice out of this passage is verse 44 where it says, But I say to you, love your enemies. This is where, for me, it gets, it gets interesting. Because the word for enemies here is the exact same word, ekthos, as is in Romans 5, which is, again, the strongest form of opposition that an enemy can have. This is that word. It's the exact same word. It's the exact same phraseology that is being used. So obviously, the connection is made between Romans 5 and Matthew 5, that when God, who called us enemies, reached out and saved us in that enemy state, when he calls us to love our enemies, he's asking us to do the exact same thing. And let me tell you, if you've ever, ever tried to live this out, it is easier said than done. The words coming out of my mouth, 
you understand them, I understand them, they're great words, we get it, it's stuff that we've heard our whole lives, but the minute we start putting this into practice, it takes on a whole other challenge. So because loving your enemies is not an easy endeavor, and and because it's something that God is calling us to do, we need to rely on the presence and the power of his Holy Spirit in order for us to be able to do this. Uh, But I mean, it's not easy stuff. I mean, I have a hard enough time practicing this kind of love with my kids, let alone my enemies. Here's my story. You're in for a whopper. So a few days ago, um, we had to, you know, we just got back from vacation, and uh, we had to, uh, the house was empty, so time to make a Costco run. And so pile the kids up in the van, head down to Costco, and we're like, all right, let's, let's get it done. Let's just, you know, get in there and get out. Let's just try and do our best here and just, just get, get it done. So, uh, you know, we got a, a grocery cart overflowing with, the, the, you know, the bare necessities of life, and we're in the checkout, and the kids are being ornery, and I'm like, okay, Hunt, I'm just going to take these three, and I'm just going to get a drink for them or something just to get them out, out of your hair, out of my hair, and then meet me at the tables over here, and then... We'll go check out, or we'll go in and, and load up the van together kind of deal. So I go to the kids. I'm like, kids, because if you go to Costco, I mean, it's a great deal. It's, it's a buck for a pop or a buck 50 for a pop and, and a sausage. I mean, it's a massive sausage. And I'm like, like it's a great deal. I mean, a bu- buck 50, I do that every day. But who knows what's in that sausage? I have no idea. <laughs> Tastes good, though. I mean, I love those. Tastes good for days. Anyways, so, um, so I go to them, and I'm like, kids, who wants a drink, and who wants a drink and a sausage, a hot dog? And all three of the kids were, were I, mean, oh, I just want a drink, just want a drink, just want a drink. I'm like, fine, I'll get you a drink, no problem. I go, I order three drinks, and then one hot dog and drink combo thing, and I pay my $4.06, <laughs> cheapest Costco, oh, I had to pay, you know, 500 to get that 400 but you're $4, you know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, this is how it is, Costco people, we know, we know. Um, and so I, I go, b- b- walk back over to the table, I give them their drinks, I open up my hot dog, and I take a bite, and all of a sudden they're looking at me like, where's my hot dog? I'm like, you didn't ask for a hot dog. I asked you clearly, who wants a drink, who wants a hot dog? Nobody wants a hot dog. Nobody wanted anything but a drink. They're like, but I wanted a hot dog. And all three of them started jumping down my throat. Oh my goodness, I turned at them. And it was at that moment, I was like, you kids are entitled. You have just been on a sweet, sweet vacation in the sun for a week and a half. You have just been given everything you want on that vacation. It was the most amazing time of your life, blah, 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 blah. And then you come home on Wednesday at 2.30 in the morning, and we find out from a message on our phone that there's no school for the next two days. (laughs) I'm like... For the next, last two days, all you did was just sit at home while mommy and daddy try to recover, and you're on your screens. You never get that, but this is what you got. And, and, and now you're in Costco. I'm giving you pop. I never give you pop. And now you're jumping down my throat about a hot dog? <laughs> my wife will attest to this. She's in one of the classes right now. She will attest to this. I stood up in Costco. I didn't care who was looking at me. <laughs> I'd had it up to here. I was done with kids. They were supposed to be in school Thursday and Friday. I was supposed to have my life back. It didn't happen. And so I stood there, didn't care who was looking at me, and I just began to lay into them. And you want to know something? I was justified with every word that I spoke to them. I gave them what they deserved. Isn't it interesting that while we were enemies of Christ, he didn't give us what we deserved, but in fact, he gave us what we didn't deserve. This is the kind of love that Christ is calling us to. I can't even do it with my kids, (laughs) yet he wants me to do it with strangers with enemies, people that I don't even like. Yet this is the kind of love that he's calling you and me to. 
when we love our enemies, we are exhibiting the very kind of love that Christ has given us and asked us to give in return. And it's an impossible kind of love. We understand that. And it's impossible for us to offer on our own because we don't have that capacity. Yet it's only when the love of Christ enters us and truly gets a hold of us that we can give that kind of love out. So I would say that if you have love in your heart towards your enemies, there's a good chance that that was one of those identifiers. There's assurance there that God has done something great in your life. I would say that there's great assurance. I would say for me, I'm still working on it. I don't know why it's so hard for some of us, but it's something that we're working towards. But it's something that doesn't come naturally. It's something that we have to ask for. It's something that God, you know, challenges us with, but he doesn't leave us without tools to get there. Proverbs 5, 21 to 22 says this, If your enemy is hungry, you better give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, you better give him water to drink. And in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Interesting, isn't that? See, I think there's two responses to loving your enemies. I think one response is that they will accept that love and they will realize that that is Christ's love and that they will turn to Christ as a result of your obedience to display that kind of love. That's one response. I think another response as displayed here would be that um, you would heap burning coals on their head. Basically, essentially, that breaks down to meaning they just can't deal with it. They can't comprehend it so that they just get out of the scene. They just leave you alone. They're just gone. Now, my story on this one is, is when I was um, in my early 20s, I, I ran summer camps uh, for a church. And this one camp we had, it went all the way up to the Gravenhurst area, somewhere up in that northern uh, region. And we were running a camp up there. And there was just uh, one staff member at the camp who just had it out for me. I like absolutely had it up. I had no sweet clue what was going on. I had no idea why. And uh, this person just, every turn I would make, every corner, it would just be a dagger, 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 dagger. I'm like, I'm 20 odd years old. I have no idea what's going on. I'm a sensitive kind of dude. I'm like, I don't know what's going on, but my feelings are hurt here. And so in that moment, I remember um, saying, you know what? I have no idea what I did, but obviously I did something to tick uh, her off. And so I ended up saying, I'm just going to be nice to her. I'm just going to go out of my way and just be nice to her. And the craziest thing is that it actually worked. She was able to get over whatever she had going on in her, towards me, whatever being was in her bonnet, she was able to get over. I didn't even know what it was, but um, my response to her was genuine. It was from my heart. And as a result, she saw that. And to this day, she's doing ministry work out in... Um, uh, First Nations, and we're one of her biggest supporters, me and Jordan. It's amazing. Um, but the interesting thing about that was when we give love to our enemies, you can't fake it. Like, we can, we can try and say, okay, I'm going to love you, but, you know, I, I'm begrudgingly doing this. I'm doing this because I have to. But if it's not real, it's it, it just not going to go anywhere. Make sure that when God calls you to love your enemies and those that oppose you and all that kind of stuff, those that you don't like, the unlovables, whoever he's calling you to love, you better make sure that you're not faking it because, I mean, it's too easy to read through. Anyways, back to the story at hand. The whole concept that we're talking about, love and salvation, um, as it relates to faith, hope, and trust, um, this kind of flew in the face of what the teachers of the law were teaching back in the day. Uh, this idea of loving your enemies and, and praying for those who persecute you, like this whole idea, it, it was completely opposite. They were still stuck in the whole eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth kind of vengeance, uh, kind, of a, kind of a mindset, which was part of the Old Testament law. They could not fathom this concept of loving their enemies and they could not embrace that salvation really had nothing to do with circumcision, being a Jew, or performing good works. For many, if they could not see it, do it, touch it, or feel it, then they would not believe it. Faith, even as their forefather Abraham and David had taught, faith was a concept completely lost on them. 
So let's talk about faith for just a few moments. When we come to God as guilty sinners, we deserve judgment. And when we trust Jesus Christ and him alone for our redemption, he doesn't give us that judgment, but he gives us salvation. Our response to that is called faith. We're trusting that, you know, even though we don't see it with our hands or anything like that, we're trusting, believing that this is true. I've, I've never seen God. Like with my eyes, I've never seen him. Um, I've never actually been to heaven, although I'd love to, maybe not right away, maybe a long time away, but I'd love to get there one day. Maybe if I could visit and come back, that'd be great. But I've never been to heaven. I have no idea what it's like. I've never even seen Jesus Christ. But by faith, those things which I cannot see, they become realities to me. They take on substance for me, and by faith, I gain and acquire assurance and conviction about things that my eyes cannot see. Hence the verse in Hebrews 11.1 1, where it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen. Faith is an incom- incredibly important component to salvation. It's trusting that God will do what he said he will do. Believing that even though I can't see God, even though I can't see heaven or I've never been to heaven or can't see with my physical eyes Jesus Christ, it's believing that he will stand on his promises and he will do what he said he will do. And that faith comes from everything he is about. Let me give you an example on this one again from my vacation. So part of our vacation, we went to uh, Disney World. Um, and if you know anything about Disney, over the past year, they opened up a new park or part of a park called Star Wars Land. Any Star Wars fans here? Yeah, and me neither. So, um, <laughs> I really, I'm really not. I, I just, I, I just, I, I don't get it. I just don't see the fascination with it. But my son, man, Calvin is just totally into Star Wars. He loves Star Wars. He's all about Star Wars. And so we're like, well, if we're, if we're, if we're here for the, for the boat trip, then might as well, you know, let, let, let's try and get him into Star Wars Land, okay? So we got into Star Wars Land. There's this one ride that everybody's been talking about. It's called Rise of the Resistance. Now, I have no idea what this ride is about, but I know that in order to get on this ride, you have to show up to the park. Park opens at 8 o'clock. You have to show up at 5.30 a.m., you have to line, no, wake up, sorry, wake up at 5.30 a.m., get there by like 6.30 a.m., and you're in line with like thousands of other people before the park even opens. This is ridiculous. And you're standing there with all these thousands of other people, and the whole goal is just to be able to get into the park at 8 a.m. so that you can activate the app and then try to get on, you know, the waiting list for that ride. Right? I know. It's insane. And so... Um, so we did it. We, we got up for my son, my entitled son, <laughs> wants a hot dog, and we stood in line, we got in there, and we got a boarding group, which was boarding group 43. Only 60 groups are released or something like that. So long story short, we were able to get into the ride at 3.30. Our flight, uh, our, 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 um, our flight was out that night, but we had to get back to the hotel to get out by 5, so it was kind of real, real, real close. But... All that to say, that ride was absolutely mind-blowing. It was, like, unreal. I, 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 I can't even put into words this 25-minute experience, what I just went through, because it was like nothing I've ever, ever, ever been or experienced, and, and it was well worth the whole wasted day just to get on it, which is insane, and I, I feel like this crazy Disney guy. I'm not that guy. I'm really not that guy. Um, <laughs> I got off the ride, and immediately it hit me. I was like, man, there's an incredible spiritual parallel here. I knew that this ride was going to be good because Disney has, you know, years and years of excellence behind it. They are known for, you know, breaking the, the, the bounds uh, or whatever. They're known for the, the level of excellence and everything that they do. If it's got the name Disney on it, you know that it's like, boom, it's excellent and so on and so forth. And so I knew that going into this ride, my level of faith was such that I'm going to sacrifice this whole day just to get to this little part over here because I know it's going to be worth it. And when I got out, I was like, 
This is the gospel. This is exactly what Jesus teaches us with faith. It's because everything in this Bible teaches me and shows me the goodness of God. Everything in this Bible shows me the power of God. Everything in his word shows me that, you know, he takes care of his children and his promises are true. And so when I read this word, it creates this faith that, oh my goodness, yes, I believe that if he says he's going to go and prepare a place for me in heaven, it's going to be amazing. And if my mind is being blown watching this, you know, little, little Star Wars Disney thing, then can you imagine what my mind is going to be like when I get to heaven? It's going to be out of this, well, out of this world, like literally out of this world. Come on. Um, but it all stems from this level of faith. Because the brand, if I can talk in that kind of language, the brand of Jesus Christ has never failed us. It has never forsaken us. It has never left us high and dry. It has always brought us through to fruition, to completion, because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So we have faith for the future because of what he's already done. We have faith for the future because of what we've seen him do in our lives, how he's moved us and how he's, you know, saved us, how he's healed us, how he's done all these, like, like when you look through the gospels, what do you see mostly through the gospels? When Jesus, three years of ministry were here on earth, what was he trying to do? He was trying, he, he would heal people, he would use miraculous, he would show in, in, incredible wisdom and teachings, and he used all these things in the temporal to show them that he had power over the eternal. And so when we look at all that, this should do for us what Disney did for me, say, absolutely. I know that because of this, my future is secure in Jesus Christ. And so when we look to the future, we look to the future with great hope because of the assurance that we have of what we believe. Faith is believing what we believe because there's a basis for it. And hope is how we respond to that faith. We respond with great hope and anticipation for the future because our faith is secure in him. Does that make sense? I hope so. Um, Because we know that the one who makes the promises is also the one who stands behind them. And he's the one that never leaves us, forsakes us. And as that famous verse in Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, but thoughts to give you a future and a hope. All of this is so that you and I can live with hope. Have you ever thought about that word hope? Do you have hope? Do you have hope for tomorrow? Do you have hope for your current situation or circumstance that you're feeling? I don't know. Do you have hope for the future in heaven? Do you have hope? hope? Hope is absolutely an incredible part of the Christian walk. Without hope, we have nothing. If we can't hope that our situation will improve, if we can't hope that our eternity is secure in heaven, what have we got? There was a group of scientists in the 50s and the 60s, and they performed an experiment on wharf rats. Interesting experiment. Not something I would ever do or condone, but hey, back in the 50s and 60s, they did a lot of things. And so they took these rats, about a dozen of them, and they put these rats, these wharf rats, in buckets. Put these 17, uh, a dozen buckets around, and then they dropped, they filled the buckets with water, and they dropped the rats in the buckets, one by one, one by one, one by one. And their goal was to see how long it would take for these rats to succumb to the water and drown. And so over the next few minutes, the rats were just kind of like swimming around, struggling. And then the five minutes turns into seven minutes, seven minutes turns into ten minutes. 10 minutes turns into 15 minutes, and finally 15 minutes turns into 17 minutes, and not one of those rats made it past the 17-minute mark. I know, sad story, if you like rats. Uh, There's a part two to that story, and the part two goes like this. They took another dozen rats, and they put them in dozen buckets again, filled them with water, and then they dropped the rats in, and then they started the timer again. And they said, okay, let's, uh, let's let's do this again. 
At this time, though, at the 16, 17-minute mark, when just as the rats were succumbing and just starting to go on beneath the water, the, uh, the scientists would reach underneath and rescue the rat. And for the next two days, they put these dozen rats back in their cages, fed them, watered them, and made sure that they were healthy again and got them back up to 100% order. This time, after those two days, they put them back in the same buckets. And instead of lasting 17 minutes before they died and succumbed to the water, each one of those rats made it between 36 and 37 hours. That's what I said. Look it up. Google that. Google that. Google that. Not right now. Um, I know. I was like, this is insane. I had different resources. Absolutely. They went from 17 minutes to 36 hours. And the only conclusion that the scientists had to make regarding that was they had hope. Because they had been rescued before, there was hope established in their mind that that rescuing would come again. So I'm reading this. I'm like, this is the gospel. You and I, 17 minutes in that water, God came down through his son, Jesus Christ. He rescues humanity. And then we're back in the water. Whenever we find ourselves back in the water, hope is restored because we've already been rescued. Because the brand, if I can use that language, of Jesus Christ never fails us. It never forsakes us. It never changes. It's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's rescued us once. He will rescue you again. This is the foundation of our faith, which is expressed through hope. This is why Christians have such great hope. I don't know. I don't know how people walk through life without hope. I don't. I mean, the single biggest question in our world today is a question that nobody's asking. The whole world is so focused on environmental, global warming, stuff like that. And I'm like, well, God's going to blow the earth up at some point and just make a new one. You, knew, you realize that, right? Like, I'm thinking, you guys are only thinking temporal. Stop worrying about the climate as much as you should be worrying about your soul. Where are you going when you die? Like, that should be the one question that every single person in this world should be focusing on. Like, that should be the primary question. Then everything else falls secondary, tertiary, so on. But nobody's asking that. Well, not many are. Too many people are just content to figure out, hey, you know, I'm going to save up my RRSP, save up my retirement, get my wills in order and all that kind of stuff so I can take this chunk of money, pass it down to my next of kin, and, and so on and so on. It's like this revolving, keep on passing it down, passing it down, passing it down. But where are you going? What happens to you? Like we are so focused on these 70, 80 years that we've been given why aren't people asking about the future? To me, I can get through life. I can get through difficult circumstances, situations, because ultimately my hope is in heaven. When, when, when I walk through difficult seasons of death in my family and the what if of death, whether it's cancer, sickness, whatever the case may be, I walk through that knowing that at the end of the day, whether death happens or not, my future is secure in heaven. Like, heaven is my home. Do you, heaven's your home? Do you know that you are not a human being? This is weird. <laughs> but think about it. You're not. You're going to live for eternity, not in this body, but your soul. So you are really a soul. You've just been given a human being body for a period of time. Yeah, this is our focus, but the focus should be that, right? Th th this body is just a blip in the screen of eternity. You are a soul. You're just housed in this, you know, flesh and blood for a period of time until you're given a brand new, perfect body, whatever that will look like. I hope I have really big muscles, long hair. That's what I'm hoping for. It's like, great. Big beard. <laughs> our hope 
is in heaven. Our hope is in eternity. But eternity doesn't start when you die, does it? Eternity has already begun. We're living in the middle of your eternity, my eternity. It's now. It was then. It's tomorrow. It's, 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 it's already. Don't wait till you're two minutes before dying to get that squared away. Get that ready. Get that squared away right now. Our hope is in heaven. And because it's in heaven, we know that our hope is for tomorrow as well. God doesn't just care about getting you to heaven, but he wants you to walk through this life. And he knows that even though you've got tribulations, those tribulations will produce perseverance as you, as you cling to him, as you hold to him. And as you hold to him and as you persevere through your tribulation, he will produce godly character in your lives. And you will see that. And once you see that this perseverance is being established and godly character is being established in your life, then that restores great hope that God is in control and he's doing something in your life. And although he doesn't get you out of that situation in the time that you may want to be in and out of that situation, the reality is that he controls everything and he knows everything and he cares for you implicitly. And so when you walk through stuff, you know that he's walking with you every single step beside you. For many of us here today, I think this message, if you've heard anything today, I hope that it restores hope. Hope for tomorrow. Hope for the next week. Whatever situation you're going through, whether it's sickness, financial, relational, family, there has to be hope. Because he has secured our eternity in heaven, there is hope for today. There is hope for tomorrow. He will walk you through this. It may not be in the time that you want it to be. It may not be how you want it to be, but he will walk you through this season, this tribulation, and he will produce perseverance in your life. He will, mark my words, he will produce godly character if you allow him to, and all of that together will produce hope because we've got this. We've seen what he has already done. We know what he can do, and because of that, we can stand here and say we have great hope. We can sing about the goodness of God because we know it's true. We can sing about heaven even though we've never seen heaven because we know that the brand of Jesus Christ is the best brand of all time and we know that it's going to be as he said it would be because he stands behind his promises. Not one has he ever failed. Not one. You can trust him. You can have faith that he has your best interests at heart. And you can allow hope to be restored. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your goodness in our lives. I thank you for how great your love over us really truly is. God, I simply pray right now as we've talked about faith, hope, and trust, that for those of us sitting here that are struggling, maybe with our situations and our circumstances, family, sickness, financial, whatever the case may be, God, work-related, God, I pray right now that you will restore hope in our hearts that you are in control. That is, you have called us to love our enemies and, and those who uh, come against us and those who are unlovable, that God, your love will throw th flow through us and will be able to be received by all who come across our paths. I pray that we will truly love each other as you're calling us to love. And God, I pray that as we do that, as we are obedient to you, you will continue to do incredible things in our lives. You will continue to remind us of how great you are day in, day out. So Holy Spirit, thank you for hope. Thank you that our great hope is in you. Our great hope is in heaven. Our great hope is eternity. And our great hope is tomorrow because you control it all. So as we leave today, let us leave knowing that there is hope in our hearts because of Jesus Christ. So in the name that is above any other name, the sweet name of Jesus Christ, all God's people said, amen and amen.